Hi, and welcome to NUFC Matters. As promised, we have a special Q&A uh, asking your questions to Ian Lafrenia, who is uh, making his second appearance on the show. Hi, Ian. How are you? I've been asked back. You've Just been waiting. asked back. I'm waiting. Yeah, I still haven't received my fee for the first one. <laughs> the check's in the post. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We'll crack straight on with the questions. I've got some fantastic questions on Twitter and on Facebook. So um, we'll go to Joe Walker first. He says, Ian, firstly, thank you for a million memories. Can I ask, did you seriously expect the casting of Afrida Zane Pet to bring your characters to life in the way that they did? Each actor just seemed so perfect for the character. And as for Oz, he says. Well, yeah, there was... It, it, the, the guys, it was an amazing job casting. Um, Tim and, and uh, Kevin, uh, and of course, they you know they were they'd done work. I mean, they, they they weren't newcomers, so it wasn't a risk. They just fitted in so nicely. The the uh, the big risk was Jimmy, but that's because they did a, they did a casting call in Newcastle. I wasn't there. It was the producer and the director went up, uh, Martin and Roger. And people came in and read, and Jimmy came in, literally just walked in off the street uh, and said, what's going on? <laughs> and so he, they then rang Dick and I, and they said, we saw a guy in Newcastle who could be amazing, or he, he, he could be, it, it, it mightn't work out at all because of his lack of experience. Jimmy had an equity ticket. You know, you need an equity ticket to be an actor because he had he'd been a, he was a singer. He had a band called the Crabs and he was the lead singer. And so he, he had an equity ticket. So they brought him down to London and we had this big casting session in a church hall uh, in, in the middle of London. And I remember that when Jimmy, you know, came in and read the part, whatever it was, I remember Dick, he whispered to me, Please, when Jimmy walked in without without him opening his mouth, um, Jim, Dick whispered to me, "Please, please let him be able to let him be able to act just a little, <laughs> because he just looks all right. Well, he could he could act more than a little, uh, but I think the chemistry took everyone by surprise. It it happens rarely, you know, especially when it's a gang show like that with all those characters." It happened in porridge for us, you know, just the chemistry. And Afida's impet. I mean, I give all credit to Martin and Roger, who who did uh, the bulk of the casting. When when Dick and I saw people, you know, they were they were. It was their second reading. It was like the short list. We, so we didn't see the long list. Okay. Great day's work. Yeah, great day. Chas McBain says, why hasn't Spender ever been released on home video or DVD? It has. It has because um, if you go on, if you Google in Spender, there's three websites come up that you can buy the series. Um, I've I just found this recently. You, you can buy it on buy it on DVD the whole series. There's there's three different companies offering it. Okay. I don't know what, don't hey, know what the quality's like, but Google. But, but definitely possible. Just Google spend a TV series, and, and there will be offers of buying it. Okay, there you go. Hopefully, yeah, uh, you get that sorted. Chaz Darren Cowan says, in your mind, Ian, what happened to Ali Fraser? Uh, when series two ended with him and Kenny and the lads being chased by the Spanish uh, Spanish police heading for Tangiers. Oh, thanks. The easy ones first. Uh, the <laughs> hard one. um, I, I mean, Ali was this very wriggly character. I love, you know, he was, uh, what's his name? Played him, Peter. Um, oh, God. Great. I what? What? Yeah, great actor as well. Yeah, it'll come back to us. You, you tell um, us what you tell us what but, happened, and I'll find that out. Well, I think from Tangier, uh, he probably wriggled his way back to the UK, but but by, by by you know smart lawyers, smart lawyers probably, you know people like him get away with it, don't they? Or he maybe have gone to a country where there's no extradition treaty with Britain, 
that of that of course used to be Spain, but then that was taken away. He he probably he's probably in Dubai. Bill Patterson. Bill Patterson. Bill's in Dubai. Good stuff. With Andy a, Mon- with, a, with, with a much younger woman. <laughs> Andy Montana says, does personal experience and people you've met in your life inspire you to create characters and scenarios for those characters to play out on the screen? Well, it's, it, I don't know about personal experience. It's observation. It's being, you know, constantly curious about people. I mean, I have no personal experience of bricklaying or prison or, or antiques with Lovejoy or recent series that we've done the bank job movie any i haven't any experience with robbing banks but but you you i think the thing that made an enormous difference to dick and i who were both you know uh instead of going to you know, who both of us went into the i went into the army dick was in the air force that was only two years that and we didn't know each other but when we talked about it later years that experience, certainly for something like our feeders and pet or something like, or even the, uh, whatever happened to the light lads, was invaluable. You know, we were just two 18-year-old minor public school idiots who didn't know anything about anything, especially our own identities. And suddenly, you know, we were in a hut with people from all sorts of life, from old Etonians to gobbles, gangsters. And it was an incredible learning experience. I don't think our writing would have come, our ensemble writing, something like our fetus and pet. Uh, I think the DNA of that was was military service. Okay, uh, Jeff oh. Campbell. Jeff Campbell says, which of the, which of your comedy dramas do you think would lend itself best to modern times, or has that particular brand of humour passed us by now? Oh, it may have done. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question. I mean, we, we, we've we been, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think that they, whatever happened, the light is, is timeless in, ter- in, in terms, I think we've seen it over and over again on shows. It's just about friendship. It's about friendship and it's about nostalgia. It's about the ties that bind. And that's fairly timeless. Afida's MPET is still relevant in terms of there's still an underclass, there's still people who have to seek work. There's still people, look, look at America now, look at those people pouring over the border. Look at the pictures on television. There's, there's still uh, a, a, an enormous amount of ha- have-nots as opposed to, Dick and I always used to write mostly about have-nots as opposed to the haves. So I think everything is relevant um, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think this, the sort of archetypal, I mean, programs. Paul Oxley says, um, it's a difficult one really to pick one out, but he says, who was your favorite actor out of all the shows that you worked on? Oh God, that's so hard. Uh, I, I'd like to, I'd like to say them all. It, it was very exciting working with Sean Connery. It was very gratifying and a great learning experience to work with Michael Caine, who we worked again with just three years ago when we did that My Generation, the documentary. I mean, they were stellar stars, so it's exciting. And I loved working with Bill Nye, and I, but I loved working with everyone. I can't pick them out it's like saying who's your favorite child yeah it is uh, it really is um uh david tennant was extraordinary um it, it's just sometimes when you sit in the room at the beginning of a show they have what you call a read through the first time the cast are all together so they've all got the part so they're all kind of relaxed and then you read the script and it's the first time you hear the words said for Dick and I, and, and you see where the mistakes are, where the flaws are. Uh, and some actors are hopeless, are, are very shy or very awkward. And then they get it, then they get better. Richard Beckinsale was terrible at the read-throughs. I think maybe Richard, may, he might've been dyslectic, but then by the time he did the show, of course he was brilliant. 
And then there's some actors uh, who just sort of shine out at that, at, at that table, you know? But, uh, but I love actors. I, I have a, a, an enormous soft spot for them. They've made all our, they brought all our programs to life. So we owe them an, an enormous debt of gratitude. So I, 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 I embrace them all. Paul Usher says, if James Bolam and Rodney Buse had made up, would there have been any more likely lads, do you think? I don't think so. But, that, you know, the, this thing about them making up, having a feud, it, it was so over-exaggerated. They just, I mean, they just went their separate ways. They weren't people who hung out and socialised together. I, I was close to Rodney and he loved the Northeast, so he used to come up with me a lot. But, but Jimmy just went about, it, went about his own life. Physically, they didn't live near each other. The, what, I mean, Rod, they, they both. I mean, I remember. I read recent, not re, well, fairly recently, Jimmy's um, Jimmy's remarks when Rodney died, and it was very gracious and very complimentary. The the, the thing of a feud. I mean, we never had a bad moment on the set ever. You know, it was not a moment where they were feuding actors, or I, I need to be in my own dressing room. It was none of that bullshit. It's just been very exaggerated. I don't think there would have been another series, though, because someone's just sent me a photograph on my phone of me and a rock star. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I don't think there would have been another series because it had kind of ran its course. Yeah. But then I was, you know, you can be wrong. We never said there'd be another Alfidas in, the, but there was. I think it, it would have needed a little gap um, but at the time that we'd done 27 episodes in two years, it was exhausting. The, 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 I do regret not doing another series of Porridge. That definitely should have had another. But this is so long ago, God. Matty Duggan says, in series three of Afvida's Impact, we got introduced to Wyman, who was Wayne's son from a one-night stand. Matty's question is, why didn't we find out what had happened to Wayne's other son from his first wife, Krista? I have no idea. <laughs> ne Simple. Ne next question. <laughs> simple as that, really. Simple as that. Okay. Um, Joe Walker asks a simpler one. He says, is there any sitcom that you've watched or TV series that you wish you'd written? Oh, yeah. Well, in the old days, I loved, I loved Rising Damp. Uh, everyone wishes they'd written uh, Faulty Towers, but I, I loved Rising Damp. And, uh, and, of course, in more modern the more modern contemporary years, I love The Office. Um, I, I love The Office. The series that I, I think, oh God, I wish I'd been involved with that, that's been on recently is Shit's Creek. Have you been watching that? No, I haven't watched it, but my friend Dave Beanie has said that I should watch it. Well, it's actually a Canadian series, although all the actors are American. It was shot in Canada, but it's supposed to be like, oh, you should, Shit's Creek is wonderful. It's been on for four seasons. Uh, it wins the you know Emmys every year. It's just won the Golden Globe for best comedy. Yeah, uh, and I would think The Office was another example of uh, of a show you'd have been proud to have been associated with. That and, is and, and but it's not my and Veep. Veep was a great show, but it's not my province. I, I know politics, but I do admire it. Brings us neatly on to Dave's question, which I almost forgot. He said, can you ask Ian about working on The Prisoner of Zender for Peter Sellers? Uh, have you got any stories about Peter Sellers? Well, that was that film is dreadful. Let's let's be right up front. It's probably it's um, I, I, I there was a lot of reasons why it was bad, but I'm not Dick and I aren't absolving ourselves. But it just, it, it's, it, it's an embarrassment. Sellers uh, is famously, I wrote a piece about Sellers in the book Dick and I did recently, go out and buy it, more than likely. And I wrote a whole piece on Peter Sellers. Uh, and, and he could be very difficult, very neurotic, very awkward, very demanding. But with Dick and I, he was fine. I think that's, I've noticed that before with people have a reputation of being difficult. When there's two of you, it makes it easier, you know, to have a relationship. So our, our, our relationship with Peter Sellers was primarily based on two dinners, one in the south of France, when we discussed 
doing the film. And it was a great evening of what, what happens with Peter is if you have something in common with Peter, which is his past, which was music hall and the goons, you've struck a chord. And so when we went to the, uh, this is 1979, when we went to the dinner in France, we took Bill Wyman with us because Bill and the Stones who are in the south of France uh, recording. And we knew that Bill knew every goon show that's ever been made. So once we started talking about the goons, we had one of those wonderful evenings of reminiscences. And Peter told great stories about, you know, vaudeville and music hall. Our next dinner was when we were making the film in Vienna. And it was another very nice evening. In between, they made this film, which is really, I only, I only knew one friend who, who, who liked that film. I was woken up at two in the morning and it was an actress calling from New York. So she must have been up all night. And she said, um, uh, have you still got me? She said, oh, we all went to see Prisoner of Zender. It's so <laughs> funny. And I said, were you all high? And she said, well, of course. I said, well, that explains it. <laughs> Brilliant. But the, you know, the film just it doesn't work. Yeah. But Sellers, uh, it, it, and, and what was good is after that film, he did bounce back. He, he did that wonderful film being there and he got nomin nominated for an Oscar. Fantastic. And, uh, so it was a, a very, very rewarding experience for two young writers. I bet it was. Great question here from Nick. He says, the hut in Afida's in pet. Did Ian ever foresee that it would become such a huge character itself and an integral part of the show? No, I mean, I hated the hut. <laughs> but no, but no, because when we went to Elstree, I, I didn't mind, uh, in Germany, it was all exteriors, you know, the building site. The hut was built in Elstree and it was so cramped and, and awful and the sound was terrible. I kept saying, I can't hear a line of dialogue every time I saw what, you know, the rush, I can't hear any dialogue. Uh, and, and I think the actors hated the hut, but it, but it became a character because the claustrophobia of the hut was so real and the actors themselves became the characters because they had their own beds and they all hated uh, th that environment. So you're right, the hut was, was, a, was a character in the series. Yeah, great question that, Nick. A uh, big shout out to our sponsor, Spider VPN, uh, Jordy Riffs, qtechshop.co.uk, and John from Jab Signature. And QTech, uh, John, just as Alan, he asks a question. He says, Does Ian have a favorite episode of Athlete as Ian Pet? And is there a possibility of any more episodes? No, there isn't. But you can't, no, I never say never again. But uh, that's a silly thing to say. But because what we've done, is with Sunday for Sammy, we've had the joy of bringing those Alfidas and people back for that show. And so we always write a sketch, you know, every two years, Sunday for Sammy. Uh, at, well, it used to be the city hall. Now it's moved to the big one. And so we've, we, it's not like we ever said goodbye to them because every two years we, we do this. The, I think my favorite episode, and I think by coincidence, it's the highest, uh, number of viewers is Marjorie doesn't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. When Jimmy came back and, and, and it was with his son. But I loved, I loved the 2000 and, you know, the zeros outfit. I loved that series when we brought the, the, the uh, transporter bridge. And, yeah, I, cool. and, I, and I loved the series in Cuba. Um, so there's episodes in those which would be favorites. Yeah, it was a strong. It was strong when it came back. It, it's so difficult to rebrand, you know, to know. rebrand and bring something back. But it worked, and that that's a credit to the writing. Well, it's, well, it's the actors. Credit, well, the original credit. We said no, 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 no. We, if you, this is not his question, but I might as well tell you. We stick and I say, oh no, we can't bring it back. We'll be we'll all the critics will be go. They'll everyone will slam us. Oh, can't they do anything original? You know what I mean? All the usual reasons, and then. We were in London and, and, and a lunch was organized with all the cast and Frank Rodham, uh, Martin McKean, Roger, the director, Dick and I. And it was so 
obvious at that lunch what regard and affection those actors had for each other. They'd loved working with each other and they just wanted it again. And all of them now had become very successful. They didn't need it, they wanted it. And so Dick and I said, oh, well, we'll have to think about this. And then it was Frank and Jimmy who came up with this ridiculous idea about the transporter bridge. And that was such an appealing idea. We said, right, we're in, we're in. But, uh, it, 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 and, and once they started the series, that, that affection, that, that mutual admiration society of that bunch of actors was extraordinary. I mean, because when you do films or you do series, you know, afterwards they dissolve, people go about their lives and uh, lose touch, but, but not that crew, they, they never lost touch. Great question from Rich Oliver here. He says, obviously right in the first series of Afid is and Pet, Ian wouldn't have known the writers, they wouldn't have known the actors involved. He says, was writing the second series easier as he knew what he was working with, or does that make it more difficult? Um, no, he, just wants, he wants to know a bit about the process. Yeah, it's a very good question. The first series was, well, I wouldn't say easier, but it, the, when you look at the, the first series is the best series. Um, it's because it's the essential Afid is in, it's the hut. It's the trapped environment. It's the uh, wonderful irony of a bunch of guys rebuilding the country that their dads bombed in the first place. It's like a prisoner of war film. It's like a stalag, you know, that hut. Uh, the second series was much more difficult because it's not so pure. I remember when we were making it halfway through in Nottingham, Jimmy Nail got me up against a wall it was, a bath, it was a bathroom wall in the canteen. And he was a bit belligerent. And he, and, and he, and he went on about the series, but in, about not being as good as not being as authentic. And the thing was, Jimmy was right. And I've, I've valued his opinion ever since on anything. Um, it just, it, 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 it didn't have that authentic captive situation. So, we were reaching for plots, you know what I mean? Whereas in the first series, they, they just came so much easier. Yeah. And, and we weren't, and we're, when you're writing, you're not really thinking about the actors because you haven't seen them in it yet. You're just thinking about the characters you've created. And Billy then, Trey, Billy Trey says, why did you and Jimmy never revisit Spender? Um, I've no idea. I, I like doing Spender enormously. Well, Jimmy and I were, were, were kind of separated by distance. I remember he came over to America, to LA, and I, Dick and I, I well, had an office in uh, Columbia Studios, and we were under pressure to finish the scripts for series two. And uh, he brought a, a secretary over also from the BBC. And we were writing and, and, and we were really under pressure and, and Jimmy and I were sitting in opposite desks. She was, she was like typing as we spoke and there was an earthquake. <laughs> and she, I was kind of used to it, but no one's used to an earthquake. It's quite a serious one. The whole building shook the a girl. I can't remember. Jen, she dived under a desk and Jimmy basically said, what the fuck are you doing? We've got a deadline. You know, it's like, we can't let an earthquake stop us. <laughs> Uh, so I think it was because we were in, going on different things. Did, you know, Jimmy was doing music tours, yeah, and then he wanted it, and he was doing his own stuff. Uh, and, and and Dick and I were involved with a lot of things in the nineties, a uh, lot of other programs, either overseeing or producing or making. So that's just what happened. And then, of course, we lost. You know, Sammy. That was a, that was an awful loss. Yeah. Stuart Mulhern says, uh, "Whatever happened to the likely lads?" How do you mean those characters? Yeah, I think that's. It was a very clever question. I think whatever happened to them? Someone asked that about oh, about fifteen years ago, and I said that just off the top of my head, I, Dick and I worked out that um, you know uh, Bob can you know, inherited the family business from his father-in-law, worked his ass off, worked, had a terribly stressful life. 
and eventually had to file for bankruptcy. He had two children. The daughter, uh, uh, the daughter was in rehab, and the son was a roadie for Oasis. <laughs> Just made this all up. <laughs> so, he, so he'd lost. Jimmy was Jimmy had never knuckled down, and he had a car accident. He had a car accident on that road that went from Newcastle to Carlisle. Serious accident, but he recovered, and he got a massive insurance payoff. So he ended up with money and Rodney didn't. But I never got any further. Brilliant, great stuff. Uh, How Man Yi uh, on uh, Twitter, he says, he says you're an absolute hero of his. He'd love to know where in the Northeast do you miss the most and when was the last time you came back? Well, I was there just before COVID. It's like BC before Christ. It is, isn't it? See, before COVID. So I was there, that's um, Jan- January, Jan- yeah, yeah, past January. Mm-hmm. I went to, I was up there discussing the Whitley Bay Film Festival, which then, of course, was cancelled. And I had, uh, I had dinner at an Italian restaurant in Time Out Station. Do you know it? Yes, I do, yeah. And toasters, and I and then and the year before, someone took me to that great pub. What's it called? The highlights. Oh yes, down that yeah yeah yeah. Down that God, that's that's a real pub. So I was there then. That's when I was in Newcastle just before COVID broke. Um, okay. I that what's my favorite part of Newcastle? I think I mean I love I love Time Out. Mm-hmm. I love Time Out, and then I love the middle of Newcastle. Yeah, I, I, I usually stay at the Vermont because it's just fantastic. You're right next to the castle. And if you go down those steps, you, you, you seem to be in the heart of old Newcastle uh, as much as, as new. Great stuff. Good answer. Five minutes left. Try and get through a couple of more questions. Mark Martin simply says, is oh, the take... I can the- do 10. Okay. He says, is the, is the takeover going to happen, Ian? Oh, I, but that would, that's my question to everyone over there. <laughs> I can't believe it. Every, you tell me. Well, you, uh, you and I, you and I, you and I had this conversation a year ago. No, the last time we talked and I said the American had come in the picture. Henry what Maurice. Yeah. That, and I found out he lived near me and I was going to go and bang on his front door. <laughs> I think you should still do it and see if his Henry, interest was actually can, genuine. Can you make this happen? But then he. He went off the radar, didn't he? I don't and think he now, was ever on it. I think it was a. I think it was just it a. Yeah, I think it was a, a red heron, shall we say? But um, yeah, I mean, will it happen? Who knows? Um, people keep asking me if I'm confident. I think we're. I think it's in the laps of the gods now. I think that you know things are, are mounting up against it. But you know, have faith in the sense that Amanda and and PIF and the Rubens are still trying their best, and Mike Ashley still wants to sell. But the biggest threat at the moment. Um, unfortunately, once again, under Mike Ashley is relegation, Ian, and that yeah. could scupper the whole thing. And that now losing those, losing those players. Yeah, exactly. So our th- three best players are out. That's this is this is so scary. Two points against Wolves would have eased the pressure. Another, yeah. Would have been two extra points. I mean. Yeah, let's fingers crossed we can beat West Brom at the gotta weekend. Be, gotta beat West Brom. Fulham have got to lose. Oh, oh, is it? Are they playing tonight, Spurs, or is it tomorrow? Uh, not. It'll be tomorrow, I think. Tonight, actually, I can give you an update while we're on because uh, there is there is. Well, some I'm, I'm, I'm I'm going to watch something later. All right. Okay. Well, no, they're not it's playing. Like, it's like the Likey Lads episode. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll keep I'll keep stung, but just to let you know, yeah, tomorrow night is Fulham Spurs at six o'clock. So there you go. Yeah, you're safe in the knowledge of that game is tomorrow. Um, this is but a good it's, one. It's terrible when. When you have a team, then that every week you're looking at the results of the other teams exactly. to see who's lost. That's that's what's so debilitating. It is, and we, and we go through it every year. Ollie, uh, he asks, was Oz reading the Keegan signing headline in hospital filmed just as Keegan signed, or had it been planned for prior in the script? Oh God, I've no idea. I think it was probably because it happened, and Jimmy. Probably on, on on the day said, oh oh, uh, why don't I read that? I think that was probably it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Paul Donaghy, I love this one. <laughs> See, he goes uh, in total, how many people actually 
did Big Baz chin? Hello. Oh, sorry, kid. I'm on the podcast. Oh, sorry. That was that. That was that annoying Dick Clement. All oh, right, brilliant, brilliant. Pass on me best when you speak to him. Uh, yeah, Paul Donaghy's question was: In total, how many people did Big Baz actually chin? Seven. <laughs> I'll hold you to that answer if we get asked that again in the future. Um, David Pick asks a good question. He says, I don't think I've seen an official answer on this. If Gary, if Gary Holton hadn't sadly passed away, would Series 2 have ended with Wayne and Vicky together? And what other differences would we have seen, do you think? I don't know how that's... Yes, they probably would have done... Yes, oh, it's still so awful to think about. Yeah, maybe, and you know, and Wayne was probably another reason uh, that that uh, you know, it, it just everyone was so deflated. That might have been another reason for not talking about another outfit in at the time. Oh, you know, the, the funny thing was, yeah, probably Wayne would have ended like that. But look, you don't want Wayne to be tied down with anyone, do you? Really? No. You want one. I mean, it's all those married men at home. We all want some character out there who's getting his leg over frequently. Um, <laughs> so, so, yes. Yeah, but that, that just was such a terrible thing. Yeah, it was. It was. And of course, the, the, the ending had to be stitched together because we had to have a kind of extra. Did a know, great job. Come from the back, uh, yeah, to make it, to make it uh, work. Yeah. Did a great job. Ketch says, would love to hear if Ian has made any progress with the Kinks biopic he'd been oh, trying yeah. to get off the ground. Oh, no, the film, yes. It's amazing how long we've worked with that film. I mean, between ourselves, you know, we've had Ray's very tricky in terms of the rights and in terms of what... He's, he's not objected to the script at all. It's not like he's trying to sense things. But, you know, the rights expired to his his autobiography and then Dave's autobiography. And we have to have these rights sewn up. Now, the film would have, I think, would have been made if it hadn't been for COVID. Julian Temple is directing it. And now that COVID's over, I'm just hoping it, it's picked up where it left off. I'm hoping, praying that, it, that it's made this year. Uh, by the way, I just watched... Julian Temple's documentary, uh, Crock of Gold, did you see it? About yes. Shane Brown? Brilliant. Yeah, very, really, very good. Really, really brilliant. No, thank you for the King's question. I, I was thinking it this morning when I was driving, uh, 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 just thinking again about it. Uh, it. There's a company over here, Live Nation, who wanted to be involved. And we, we, we actually did um, a new draft, Dick and I, during COVID. So, fingers crossed. Uh, we'll have a couple more questions before we finish. Uh, Chris Ferguson says, was it a conscientious decision in Slade to have football-related men in power, Venables and Mackay? Oh, of course. <laughs> yes. I mean, I used to name characters about people I was at school with in Whitley Bay. And then, oh, yes, Venables and Mackay, definitely. Okay. No, I'm not sure about Mackay. Yeah, Venables is such. A, I'm not sure about Mackay. Mackay was just seemed a good Scottish name. Paul Curry says, "What did you think of the remake of the Lightly Lads episode, No Hiding Place, starring Ant and Deck? Do you think they did the original justice?" Oh yes, I mean we met with them, and they they were such fans. You know, it it's probably not it's not as good. It's not as authentic, but I, the, 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 you know, they're such sports. Those two, that's an old fashioned word, but you know. They were such fans, so we had no problem with them doing it. Um, is it is it better than the original? No, but but they they wouldn't have expected it to be. It was a tribute. It wasn't trying to better anything. Yeah, it was it was homage. There's a posh word. It was. Mal oh, Dickinson yeah. says, "Why does Spenny Moore get referenced so often in Afrida's in pet?" Because it's a funny word. I mean, there are just some towns that are funny. It's yeah. like. Godalming's funny. Cleethorpe's is funny. Spennymore's funny. Well, it's not maybe not a funny place, but I just like the sound of it. It just yeah. has that. Well, I, I just, for me, it's got those connotations of what Durham used to be, all those mining towns. 
I'll finish with Mark Byers. He says, I've got no question for Ian. He says, I'd just like to say thank you for giving us the best TV show there's ever been. He says, it's still a timeless classic to this day with a cult following. Five Chinese crackers up your arsehole. Bang, 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 bang. Uh, <laughs> thanks to thank Mark. You. Thanks for the questions. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Good stuff. Stay safe, mate. And hopefully by the time we speak again, uh, we'll be oh, able to we'll Steve, be able to celebrate. We'll be able to celebrate staying in the Premier League and hopefully a takeover. Three points at West Brom. Take care, Steve. mate. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Geordie Land. God bless you. God bless.